Here we are in the annex. Just getting my bearings here. Spadina is behind us. And Bathurst is in front of us. Yes. Let's go. How do you even the playing field when it comes to accessibility? How do we get information about our environments before we go into them? I feel like we've very much established on this walk that what works for one of us might not work for the other. Sometimes you just have to be a go-getter yes. and <laughs> just find solutions. Here's a ramp coming up on the left. This business has thought of wheelchair accessibility. It's imagined you. Yeah. yeah. I'm Alex Bulmer. I'm blind. In October 2023, I traveled across a small part of Toronto, a place commonly called the Annex. I spoke with a number of disabled people to understand how we experience space, belonging, and how we engage with a city we want to call home. In this recording, here is some of my conversation with Igor Samardzik. Where is Igor? I'm right here. Oh, you're right there. I'm right beside you. <laughs> you sure are. Yeah, yeah. Um, may I take your arm? Yeah, 100%. On the, um... That side? Yep. Yes. Cool. Let's on do it. Side. I'm going to take your arm yeah, there. Yeah, let's do it. And uh, let's go for a walk. Okay, cool. Um, you're a city planner. Yeah, I'm, a, yeah, I'm an urban planner. An urban planner. And um, I, well, I'll talk a little bit about myself personally. So I lost my hearing when I was a kid. Um, and I have like severe hearing loss is what is, um, is what it's classified as. Right. Um, as an urban planner, my focus has always been looking at the city through an accessibility lens, I would say, and trying to take my own lived experience and perspective with accessibility and trying to advocate for that in the urban environment that we uh, get to experience. How, how does Toronto as a city compare to other Canadian cities? I'm going to be optimistic because sometimes um, the only thing that we as people with disabilities have is to be optimistic. You know, I recognize the difficulties and the challenges that our city has, and we're still struggling, I would say, to meet those obligations that we've set in regards to full accessibility. And a perfect example is transit. Um, in terms of you know ensuring there's an elevator in every single station, that's something that most likely we won't meet that deadline of 2025. However, having said that, you know, we are still will be within the next you know five years probably one of a very few handful of cities with elevators in every subway station. Thanks to different individuals, programs, advocacy efforts that are slowly but surely making their way through our system and creating that sort of disruption that is required to shift um, how we build cities. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a perfect example of that when it comes to being an urban planner and carrying with me accessibility in my work, you know, I'm able to challenge some of these preconceived notions around accessibility in some of the tables that I'm at. So I know that that is making small incremental um, shifts and dents into this armor that exists around keeping us out of the process. It's interesting you use the word build, build cities, and you're a planner. Yeah. That's all about future. Yep. Uh, you know, imagining the future and yep. moving towards it. Totally. Whereas access is so often a response to something that already exists. Yes. And, and you mentioned the armor, you know, around. Yep. So it's part of the armor uh, due to the fact that a lot of the conversations are about pre-existing systems and architecture as opposed to building for the future. I think the armor that exists is the psyche and consciousness of humanity when it comes to how we build cities. So that armor exists in a very physical form, like yeah. you pointed out, when it comes to architecture, when it comes to steps, when it comes to various aspects of the public realm, but I also think that armor exists in people's mindset. Some of the conversations I have with my friends and colleagues around disability is, you know, not even always around physical disability. Many times it's around people's perceptions and the way that people are treated. And yeah. so that is also a really important part that needs to change. Um, going through public space is actually very dangerous when you have a device that says to the public, you're vulnerable mm -hmm. because there is an awful lot of hostility <laughs> uh, that I experience. I get grabbed and pushed and I find it unnerving to, often to ask the public for assistance 
even though that's often the only thing I can do because the environment doesn't have enough, it isn't providing me enough accessible information to know where I am. But it can, it can be a very unpleasant experience to rely on the public, unfortunately. And it can also be a very pleasant experience, but they both exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked a lot about elevators and yep. ramps, but what about what about accessibility more for people who are deaf or, or blind or where systems and communication uh, are a big element of accessibility? How does that, as a, as a planner, as an urban planner, where does that conversation occur? And what do you discuss? 100%. We're just at Bloor and Spadina. Okay, we'll Should hang, we uh, we'll south? Yeah. Um, your a hundred percent right when it comes to the conversation and dialogue around accessibility there is a focus generally on you know people um, who use wheelchairs when it comes to folks who are deaf or hard of hearing uh, individuals who uh, are blind I think it's not always clear um, to be honest with you around aspects of the urban environment that focus on communication. So for example, when it comes to visual prompts or cues in the urban environment for people who are deaf or like myself who have hearing aids, I rely on those significantly. Uh, examples that I have is when a door on a subway closes, it makes a chime but it also there are lights right above the doors that also flash. I don't necessarily hear those chimes. So I rely on those lights that are flashing when I'm rushing to get onto the subway. And many times those chimes are not aligned with the light with the door closing. I will think that I have enough time to make it and the doors will close on me. Also uh, the case uh, for people who are blind as well and in terms of what you know audio type of prompts are there in the built environment. An example is you know the accessible push buttons that you see at intersections and whether they chirp or not. Yes. There's many places around the city that unfortunately those devices through design or through wear and tear are not functioning the way that they're supposed to or that yes. they were envisioned. Yes. They don't chirp, they don't make sounds. Yes. Um, you know, that's a huge issue. Uh, the signal, the, the chirpy boxes, yeah. um, often are really far away from the actual crossing. So I have to go, in fact, I think that a good example of that might even be right at Spadina and Bloor. You sort of mm -hmm. have to go off track, find the box, and then try and find your way back to where you should be standing. And totally. so you don't get the, you don't get the angle of the arrow on your arm 100%. or the positioning. And so that is, that would be my example of that. Yeah. Where does public art fit into the field of planning and accessibility? It's something that I would say isn't discussed very much in the circles that I navigate in um, when it comes to accessibility. So it's an interest of mine because I think it's really important that we have great public art in our city. Um, and it's particularly an interest because um, as a person with a disability myself, I recognize um, the lack of opportunities that people with disability ha uh, have to uh, participate and participate in public art specifically. So, I have to say, I don't think I've really considered it public art and accessibility um, mm -hmm. that much, but I know for myself, and this probably <laughs> has a lot to do with the fact that I'm blind, mm -hmm. I don't really think about public art when I move around space. When it comes to public art and the way that that is communicated to people with disabilities, I agree with you. I think that, you know, how do you even the playing field when it comes to accessibility and people with disabilities when it comes to, to art, especially when it comes to sort of visual art and how that is communicated in terms of people being able to uh, see that yeah. versus not being able to see it. Yeah. And so how do you prompt people? So I think there's definitely yeah. a conversation. How do you prompt people? I think that's a really, that to me is a, quite an important question is, prompting people, informing people that it exists. That's kind of what I've been talking to the last three people I walked with. We're all kind of 
questioning, how do we get information about our environments before we go into them so that we are prepared for the barriers that we're going to face or our expectations are set up properly for the accessibility that we're going to encounter. You bring up like a, a really good insight, which is what I try to communicate um, when I'm around decision-making tables all the time around uh, the amount of preparedness that people with disabilities have to undertake, the amount of labor they um, are responsible for doing in advance, you know, how taxing that is, the process of, you know, figuring out several days, maybe even weeks beforehand, you know, where you're going, what is the space that you're entering, you know, how to get there, when you get there, do they have an accessible washroom, do they, is it physically accessible, you know, doing all this sort of research in advance, um, following up, there's even folks that I know who will, um, you know, go in advance of whatever event or appointment they have, et cetera, just to scope out the place so that they're more comfortable and they feel prepared on the day of when they need to go. So, uh, we're turning here, we're just Let's following. Let's go this yeah. way, so now we're going, East. Yes, that's right. And then right. we'll turn, we'll go south back down to Bloor. I wanted, I, I wanted us to get off the noisy street so I could really... No worries, no worries. Uh, I, I'll also just say, just to sort of like finish off or whatnot, I don't know how much time we have, but I'll say, you know, it's interesting and sort of ironic that we're talking about art or we started talking about public art because I think accessibility in itself is a type of art in terms of how you design cities to be accessible. Um, it takes a little bit of like innovation and thinking and creativity uh, in terms of um, how you go about doing that. I will say that, you know, accessibility, having said that, accessibility is an art. Sometimes you just, you need to have folks who are able to give you some feedback, give you some inspiration, talk to people with disabilities, not always rely on codes and legislation, and sort of try to figure out what works the best for that specific context, for that specific situation. Accessibility is an art. I love it. What a great place to finish. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Thank you. That was a wonderful walk. I know. I really enjoyed it. I did too. I, I can, I have... Steps Public Art would like to say thank you to the generous sponsors and collaborators on this project. The Bloor Annex BIA, Redefine Arts, RBC, Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries, Ontario Arts Council, Canada Council for the Arts, and the City of Toronto's Main Street Innovation Grant. We could not have done it without you. Thanks for helping make a positive change.